I have seen in my practice that uh, many doctors, they actually freak out when they have to deal with a sick neonate. And it's because of the reason that they think smaller the kids are, more difficult it is to deal with them. On the contrary, it's the opposite. Smaller the kids are, it's more easy to deal with them because the specific reasons can be grouped together more easily and it becomes more methodical for a pediatrician to deal with a very small kid which we call as a neonate, especially those ones who are sick. And by neonate, we mean a baby who is in a bracket of being somewhere between day zero to day 28, or in other words, simply a baby who is less than one month old. Now, you should uh, remember that the neonates or newborns, they are very much prone to present with vague and non-specific symptoms if they are suffering from a wide variety of problems, wide variety of uh, diseases because of various reasons. Number one is that most of the systems in a neonate and a newborn are immature. Whether you talk about the respiratory system, whether you talk about the cardiovascular system, whether you talk about the central nervous system, systems are quite immature. So there is a considerable degree of overlap uh, in the symptomatology by which these newborns or neonates they can present. And that's why it's very important to understand that these non-specific signs or non-specific symptoms can actually direct you in different directions. So if you know how to group together these and what to look for, it becomes more easy for you to deal with neonatal problems. And for that reason, uh, we should remember that we have got what we call as a rule of five. So let me show you what is the rule of five. So the rule of the five is simply your hand have got five fingers. So you should remember that majority of the neonatal problems or neonatal diseases can be grouped in one of these five areas. So the first one is infections. So infections in neonates and newborns can lead to sepsis because of the immature immune system. So any infection which might be trivial in an older child can very quickly turn into sepsis in a neonate. So sepsis basically is a dysfunctional immune response because of overwhelming bacterial or viral growth inside the blood. And uh, that can present with a variety of symptoms but if untreated, that can be very quickly fatal. So sepsis because of infections is group number one. Group number two are cardiac problems. And cardiac problems in newborns are congenital heart problems. For most of the time, they are congenital heart problems. And when we say congenital heart problems, uh, though uh, acyanotic can also sometimes lead to problem, mostly we mean the cyanotic congenital heart problems, and they can be grouped under what we call as the cardiac group. Uh, again, which can present with very non-specific signs and symptoms. The third one are the surgical reasons. Again, there are different types of surgical reasons in kids because of which they can be very sick. Most of the times in premature, it's necrotizing enterocolitis or in other older kids, it could be malrotation of the bowel or it could be hish sprung disease. Then the fourth group is the group of non-accidental injuries. Uh, Non-accidental injuries uh, can be hidden. Uh, they are usually difficult to pick up. So it's important for a pediatrician to focus on non-accidental injuries, specifically if there are certain clues like um, a dodgy history or an inconsistent history, or if the circumstances are doubtful, like if the families don't do the social services, or there's a history of considerable domestic abuse, domestic violence, then that should also be on your list of preferentials. And last but not the least, the fifth group is what we call as the metabolic conditions. Again, these are um, these can be very difficult to diagnose because again, they present very non-specific symptoms and there is a huge list of different metabolic problems that can give rise to a sick neonate. Again, uh, a general pediatrician or a pediatrician working in the emergency department, he is not supposed to go and, you know, do all those enzymatic levels to see which specific metabolic disease is causing that. But your job is simply to pick up and know that if a child, let's say if a neonate is sick, uh, and then you can make that diagnosis in terms of that he belongs to the metabolic group. 
even that is enough because you can do some of the life-saving measures and the rest you leave it to the metabolic teams because usually metabolic teams geneticists and so many other people are involved in um, further diagnosis of these cases and usually it takes a lot of time before they can reach at a specific uh, metabolic problem which is caused by a deficiency of a specific enzyme now when we say that majority of the neonates sick neonates they present with non-specific symptom as compared to the older ch children in an older child who has got a respiratory problem, so obviously he can present with a high grade fever, he can present with difficulty in breathing and he can have a cough, which more or less like uh, guides you in the specific direction. But neonates rarely have got these things. So rarely a neonate would be having a significant cough, which would make you think that he probably has got some problem with the respiratory system. Most of the times, again, most of the times, the symptoms are very general general symptoms. They are very non-specific, and some of the symptoms that you would see very often in the uh, in in the emergency department, like you know when these uh, neonates newborns are brought in, they are number one lethargic. So parents would complain that the baby is lethargic. When I say lethargic, it simply means they're not very much active. They are not very much, or they are sleeping most of the time, or uh, they are not crying that much you know crying is a sign of life so, and uh, babies they do cry i mean uh, they cry when they are hungry they are cry when they're uncomfortable and crying simply means that they've got some life in them but a child who is not crying basically uh, should worry you because that simply means that there's something is subduing the higher centers so more or less there's a lot of degree of overlap so lethargy sleepy not active they are more or less the same things on a spectrum which means that something is wrong with the probably with the central nervous system or um, with the general condition of the child similarly another non-specific symptom can be that the child is off feeds and again that has to be looked into it might be just a temporary phenomenon because of no reasons kids you know can have like these ups and downs where sometimes they would feed well sometimes they can't even like you know without presence of any any illness but again, as I said, it's not specific. Sometimes it might be the only clue to something significant going on. So on being non-active, these are different terms which can be used for more or less the same thing. So lethargic, floppy, uh, sleepy, uh, not being too much active. These, you know, more or less mean the same thing on, 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 a, on a spectrum. Similarly, the non-specific could be off feed where the child is not feeding well. So the safe child should be feeding every three or four hours because milk is the only diet for these kids so even if they're fed on demand every three or four hours they should wake up and cry and then you know when they are fed uh they become content and they go back to the sleep so if a child who's sleeping too much doesn't wake up for the feeds or even if he wakes up and feeds are offered to him and he's not interested in the feeds again that could be a sign of something quite significant Fever, obviously a child who is has got a fever and here fever will means temperature greater than 38 degree Celsius in a neonate has to be taken very seriously because almost all the guidelines, whether you look at the US guidelines or the European guidelines or the UK guidelines, most of the guidelines have got this consensus that a child who has got a temperature and I, I'm, when I'm using the word child here, it simply means neonate because this whole pr pr presentation is about neonate. So when a neonate uh, presents with temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius, that you have to do a full septic workup. And a full septic workup means that you have to do full blood count with CRP, LFTs, um, uh, blood culture. You have to do a chest x you have to do LP, you have to do a urine culture and sensitive so there's a full septic screen have to be done to see which system is involved the other could be the opposite of that some neonates might not be able to um, respond to an infection or some problem by producing fever rather they go cold so they can become hypothermic so hypothermia of the temperature is low or the baby feels very cold is another uh symptom as well as a sign that uh, something uh, might significant might be going on 
Similarly, vomiting, you know, vomiting is also very non specific uh, symptom. The neonates can, can vomit because they've got a very lax lower esophageal sphincter and they can have reflux. And almost every baby has got a little bit of reflux to some extent, but sometimes the vomiting uh, can be quite significant. So if the vomiting is relentless, it is too much projectile right from the very beginning, or it is bilious, if it is any shade of green, now that has to be taken very seriously because that might be the only, only a symptom of a significant underlying um, gastrointestinal pathology. Diarrhea, uh, neonates are on, on, on milk, so unless and until they have got some uh, enzymatic deficiency like congenital lactase deficiency, which is very rare, they should not be getting gastroenteritis, they should not be getting diarrhea. So if a child or a neonate has got diarrhea, again, it could be a symptom of something quite significant going on. Mortal skin, especially central mottling. Babies have got like, um, you know, their vasomotor tone is uh, very immature. So it can sometimes just give way and babies can have like peripheral mottling. We call it acrocyanosis, especially when they are exposed to the cold uh, weather or cold environment. That's quite common. But if a baby who is known to have like good skin color, well perfused and uh, suddenly with other non-specific symptoms of feeds, uh, or not active and he develops central mot. Central mot, the mottling or the marble appearance is right there on the chest or on the trunk. Now uh, that has also been taken seriously and you have to see what's going on. I mean, maybe you, you don't find a reason for that, but again, it's your job to hunt to see if anything significantly is going on. And last but not the least is excessive crying. Now, crying is a sign of life and obviously babies, they do cry. But again, a child who is not crying or too much quiet is also like sort of a symptom you should be worried about. Similarly, a child who is having a high pitched continuous cry. Babies can cry because of colic. They can cry when they are hungry. They can, they can cry when they are uncomfortable, like too much packed up or have got dirty diapers. But some child who is not consolable, who is excessively crying when being handled and nothing can calm him down, then again, you have to look for the reasons why the child is crying. Is it some significant pain going on? Uh, usually, they can have significant pathologies here or there. They can have surgical reasons, like uh, if you look at the genitalia, there might be neonatal testicular torsion to begin with. There might be a sign of meningitis. As I said, there's a wide variety, so you have to look for that. And again, when I say the, the, you know, the underlying problems can be quite like varied, it's easy for you if you just group them together. So if a baby has got a, you know, presents with a sort of, a, you know, different symptoms from this group, non-specific symptoms, then you can be thinking, okay, whether is it something to do with infection? Is it some form of sepsis, underlying sepsis that is going on or bring up? Is it a cardiac re reason? Is something like cardiac uh, in origin which is causing these symptoms? Is it something surgical in nature? Or is it something related with non-accidental injuries, child abuse? I mean, obviously, you might find obvious so, you know, signs like bruising other things, but sometimes you might not see them unless and until us where you know, skeletal surveys and things like that are done. And also metabolic, it could be a sign of a metabolic problem, especially if it is like, you know, if it's progressing. So you have to group the things together. So if somebody asks you, okay, well, fine, a neonate who is having these non-specific symptoms, what could be the underlying problem? So there's a wide variety of underlying problems, but then can be grouped. It might be something related to infection or sepsis. It might be related to cardiac reasons, it might be related to surgical reasons, it might be related to child abuse, it might be related to metabolic reasons. So it's easy when you group them together and you will see that somehow the underlying reasons would fall in one of these groups if you follow the methodical approach. So the first thing is you know you should know what you are dealing with. So you are dealing with something which is hidden in one of these five groups. It's as simple as that. So any child who is presenting with a constellation of these non-specific symptoms and you think something might be the reason of that. That reason is hidden in one of these five groups. So let's dive into these five groups 
to see what are the common things within these five groups which can be responsible for these uh, non-specific sign and symptoms and then how to deal with them. In other words, at the end, we would also go through a method methodical approach. Let's say you've got these, a baby, a neonate who presents with these non-specific symptoms. And to begin with, you think that the reason might be hidden in one of these groups. Okay, fine. So it could be anything in these five groups. How to proceed, how to move about, and how to know which group he belongs into and then how to manage that. So we will be talking about that from this point onward. So let's talk about the first one or the sepsis. Now, this is one of the most commonest, like, you know, different studies have um, found and the data has shown us that kids who present, neonates who present with non-specific uh, symptoms to the emergency department, majority of them, if they had any reason, that was infection. And infection, obviously, in infection in neonate, we call it sepsis because of a very immature weak immune system so this should be the first thing to consider in view of an unwell neonate with non-specific symptoms so this should be the first thing that should come on your mind and this is, is very easy to rule out now what could be the like uh, the clues that it is falling in this sepsis group look for risk factors and what are those risk factors that could be the maternal risk factors and neonatal risk factors maternal risk factors could be uh, let's say a mother who has got chronic problems like diabetes, a mother who had a prolonged uh, labor, um, prolonged rupture of membrane or premature rupture of membrane or had like fever in the perinatal uh, time period. So these are some of the maternal risk factors. Neonatal risk factors could be a baby who is low birth weight or a baby who is small for his gestational age or who is born with the dysmorphism or had some uh, you know uh, had uh, perinatal events like birth asphyxia so they are at more risk of sepsis so keep your threshold low so you also check for temperature because temperature greater than 38 degrees centigrade warrants a full septic workup so what is that full septic work what does that include it includes your full blood count includes your C-reactive protein, it includes taking blood cultures, it includes taking urine cultures, it includes a chest x-ray and it also includes a lumbar puncture to rule out meningitis. Sepsis uh, in neonates is divided into early onset uh, sepsis and late onset sepsis. So any sepsis, uh, you know, which within the, you know, after birth within 72 hours, you know, if you find it that the sepsis occurred within this time period. It's early uh, onset neonatal sepsis and the early onset neonatal sepsis is usually cause if, if it is bacterial in, in nature, there are usually three groups of bacteria that cause that. So Listeria, uh, E. coli and group B streptococci. So these are the three main groups and the antibiotics should cover these. Late onset neonatal sepsis can be caused, mostly is caused by pneumococci, but rarely it can be caused by these organisms as well. So empirical antibiotics have to be started within one hour if you are suspecting neonatal sepsis. Now, the uh, broad spectrum antibiotics that are given, they are given intravenously. And again, they vary from trust to trust. Uh, like uh, most commonly, broad spectrum antibiotics which cover the gram positive as well as gram negative, they are given. So ampicillin with cefotoxime, uh, some use benzyl penicillin with gentamicin. Uh, some trust they even add vancomycin. So they would start with like uh, amoxicillin or vancomycin plus keftriaxone. And some even add uh, acyclovir if they think that if there was a history of uh, maternal genital herpes, so they would add acyclovir as well. So, but anyhow, it depends from trust to trust. You have to look at your own guidelines to see what whichever antibiotics your trust recommends. You have to go with that. But more in most of the cases, it would be something to cover the gram positive, something to cover the gram negative. And at the same time, uh, IV fluids and oxygen, uh, if the child needs that, that has to be uh, given uh, to get for the increased metabolic demands, which are quite common. So sepsis is one of the most easiest to pick it up and it's one of the most easiest to treat. So it's simple, like if you're considering sepsis, you take bloods for these things, you take blood cultures, 
and uh, obviously you have to do a septic screen before starting antibiotics but nevertheless if we, one of the things that can take time is lp so if lp is taking time don't wait for uh, lp to be done and only then start and you just start them with broad spectrum empiric antibiotics and if the blood culture reports come back then you can tailor your treatment according to that and iv fluids and oxygen as per need of the neonate that's how you treat substance quite easy Moving on, the next group is uh, of the congenital cardiac causes. Usually you would suspect if a neonate has got non-specific uh, symptoms like he's off feet with color changes. So because cardiac, you know, cardiac uh, heart is a pump. So it pumps and the blood and, you know, it, it takes oxygenated blood. The blood takes oxygenated uh, oxygen to different parts of the body. Therefore, if there's some problem with the heart, usually there would be problem with oxygenation and that would lead to color changes. So these kids can suddenly become gray, they can suddenly become cyanose, blue or dusky and they have got other symptoms uh, like they, they would be breathing fast or there will be suddenly, uh, there will be history of suddenly becoming unwell from being very well. So usually because if you go into in, into the details of the cardiac reasons we divide them into uh, duct uh, duct dependent lesions and duct independent lesions so duct dependent lesions which are quite um, critical conditions when the duct closes the ductus arteriosus closes all of a sudden from being very well they can crash within like minutes so if there's a history that the baby was very well and suddenly he became like like grayish or cyanosed and suddenly became very unwell within a within a within within a span of minutes or hours think of uh, cardiac reasons congenital cardiac uh, problems especially the cyanotic or ductal dependent lesion one of the things that gives you a clue towards the cardiac reasons that most of them would have low oxygen sats at room air so if there is a greater, uh, like if there is a more than 4% difference in pre-ductal or post-ductal. So pre-ductal is the right upper limb of the baby. The post-ductal can be the any one of the other three that will be the left uh, uh, upper limb or the left or right uh, lower limb. So you take the four limb oxygen sets and if the difference is greater than 4% in pre and post-ductal, that probably means that there is a con congenital cyanotic lesion present sometimes uh, baby can be unwell because of uh, supraventricular tachycardia so obviously by the time they've been attached to the monitor and if the heart rate is greater than 220 beats per minute think of svt and think of the reason that can cause svt and you might have to give adenosine the other thing is that when you notice low sats and you give them 100 percent oxygen the O2 sets rare the, the these sets they rarely rise significantly even with 100% oxygen and that is one of uh, the point which you can use to differentiate between a respiratory reason and a cardiac reason in a respiratory reason if the sets were low you give them 100% oxygen that would jump up like to 97 98% but if you give, if there is a cardiac reason for that and you give them oxygen, 100% oxygen, that would like hardly, there might be a little bit of improvement, but there wouldn't be any significant improvement in the sets. And as I told you that they can be divided into duct dependent lesions. Duct dependent lesions are those lesions which rely on a patent ductus arteriosus because there would be some stenosis or some like, you know, problem, atresia, stenosis, under development of a part of the cardiac system so from left side to the right side from the right side to the left side you know or in other words from pulmonary circulation to the systemic circulation this is a sort of a shortcut which um, maintains the blood flow which maintains oxygen uh, that can be transferred to different um, organs so all of a sudden when this closes anywhere between day three to day seven these kids can crash so any child who seems to be well but suddenly crashes by day anywhere between day three and seven becomes cyanose or becomes gray you think of duct dependent lesion duct independent lesions are those lesions which de do not de uh, depend on the patency of ductus arteriosus but still they can be uh, they, they, they can cause significant symptomatology and they can be felt like a hypoplastic left heart syndrome um, 
na kwa expression of iota things like that uh the crux of uh, life saving treatment in cardiac reasons if you're suspecting cardiac reasons like terminal sepsis you would start with iv antibiotics and iv fluids cardiac reasons you just start with prostaglandin e1 infusion so the dose is anywhere between 0.05 to 0.1 microgram per kilogram per minute and this has to be given as a continuous infusion so the thing is that if you are not sure you better start the baby on like prostaglandin e1 infusion because that would keep the duct open especially for duct dependent lesion it would keep the duct open and uh, obviously the baby would bounce back till something can be done by the cardiac surgeons so remember the dose is 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 microgram per kilogram per minute usually the investigations that we do most of the heart problems can be diagnosed with echocardiogram echocardiogram takes time so best thing that you can do in ed is do a chest x-ray and ecg so ecgs can point towards like any svts like if there are supraventricular tachycardias and you can give adenosine if uh, the chest x-ray shows cardiomegaly and plethora then obviously it, it, it can point in different directions and then you can think some have got very characteristic findings on the chest x-ray like the snowman appearance of the total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage or the boot shaped ha uh, heart of um, tetralogy of pellet or the egg on string appearance in transposition of the great arteries so some of the chest x-rays are quite helpful and just by looking at the chest x-ray probably you can diagnose which can be then confirmed by echocardiogram this is how you deal with the cardiac case uh, causes moving on to the surgical causes most of the surgical causes in neonates which can cause a very ill neonates are usually related to gastrointestinal system. Especially in premature kids, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis can be very tricky. It's usually to begin with, it starts with very non-specific symptoms. So the premature infant is not feeding well, might become hypothermic. And then later on as the pathology progresses, then they develop uh, abdominal distension and then even later on sepsis can also develop they can even have perforation leading to pneumoperitoneum and that can be fatal that's got a very high mortality rate in term neonates where the necrotizing enterocolitis is quite rare then you have to think about malrotation of the intestines malrotation sometimes has sprung disease especially if the baby has not passed through in the first 48 hours then you also think about his sprung disease and uh, these babies would be unwell and then as the disease progresses they would start having like uh, bilious vomiting abdominal distension and it becomes quite obvious i mean the later stages but in the beginning remember that it can present with non-specific uh, symptomatology and vomiting is one of them which might be to begin with would be non-bilious but would quickly become bilious if it is malrotation and or spring disease so bilious vomiting is your key here that's why any neonate comes and says vomiting you ask oh is it any shade of green if it is a green you know okay straight away you know uh start with your abcs put an iv lines nail by mouth you put an ng tube to decompress it and you straight away involve the pediatric surgeons the best initial test if you are suspecting uh surgical gastrointestinal surgical case is an abdominal x-ray abdominal x-ray can give you a lot of information you can look at the fluid levels you can look at the gastric bubbles which can give you a um, lot of information like for example a baby who starts vomiting on the day one or day two with let's say two bubbles and duodenal atresia especially if he's got a down syndrome as well so uh, you can pick it up even on the x-rays so the principles of uh, initial treatment in emergency department if you are suspecting surgical pediatric surgical causes in a neonate number one this baby has to be nailed by mouth so you stop all the feeds it's just gonna like you know aggravate the condition so you put them on nil by mouth or obviously their nutrition would be parental nutrition or in the beginning you can just start them on maintenance fluids then the second uh, important step in that is intestinal decompression so you want to relieve the pressure on the intestines because they are loops are getting dilated so you put a nasogastric tube in and you leave it on free flow or you have to decompress it you know what so and the third thing is broad spectrum antibiotics broad spectrum antibiotics especially necrotizing enterocolitis because when the bowels they become distended the 
and it can lead to bacterial overgrowth inside that and that can you know then seep into the blood and cause widespread sepsis so therefore broad spectrum antibiotics which covers the especially the gram negative intestinal organism that's have to be given so that's how you deal with the possible surgical uh, causes and i said like what would uh, if Angu, like if this baby is presenting with non-specific symptom what would make you think that it fits somewhere in the surgical is bilious vomiting fourth group which is a bit tricky non-accidental injuries now new nits who might have suffered child abuse they can either present with something quite obvious like you know where you would find bruising and they say kids who can't cruise should not bruise and neonates obviously they're not in that age where they would be cruising so if there is bruising especially on the back on the buttocks you have to think child abuse yes obviously we do blood tests to see that there is no other like pathology going on which might res be responsible for bruising like some form of uh, blood discrease yes but keep that in mind or if they present with subtle symptoms like they are lethargic inactive they are not feeding their excessive crying and despite your extensive workup you find out there is no sepsis you find out there are no metabolic reasons because the blood gas is fine the blood sugars are fine you find there are no surgical reasons then you can think of that i mean it's not definitely says that this would be the call but you should be thinking it should be one of the uh, broad groups of differentials on your mind how do you get the clues the early clue is an inconsistency in the history so if the history is inconsistent what they are saying doesn't make sense with those symptoms you think what's going on like could it be child abuse or if there is a changing history they say one thing to the nurse they say another thing to the doctor they say another thing to the medical student or once they give a history they oh well i remember this thing also happened now this changing type of histories could also make you worried and you should be thinking that could child abuse be uh, one of the reasons for that or another uh, clue could be if uh, you find out they are known to SS now please keep it in mind that SS here does not mean the German secret service SS SS here means social services so make sure if they are known to social service or if they've got uh, an environment where they've been involved in the domestic violence or there are uh, you know they are on the police records and again that could be another clue that if you don't find any organic reasons for these things then child abuse might be one of the reasons for uh, this symptomatology the other thing is that uh, whenever an issue of non-accidental injury is raised like um, if you think that it might be caused uh, because of non-accidental injury then a full body checkup is warranted and that full body checkup means that you have to look at the nappy area as well so once you are thinking of non-accidental injury then it's important that you um, involve the the pediatrician the name pediatrician for social services there would be definitely a safeguarding lead that has to be involved the social services have to be involved and in some cases uh, even the police might have to be informed so once uh, non-accidental injury is suspected even if the child is fine he would need to go undergo a full skeletal service which would include definite x-rays to uh, find out if there were any old fractures if he's unwell or he's got low gcs then in that case a ct scan head is also one so ct scan head is not done routinely it's only done if uh, there is a low gcs or if uh, there was like some form of acute injury which led to uh, low GCS or if the child is lethargic irritable and you think there might be something going on in at the, at the level of the brain as well and it also uh, involves doing a retinal examination by the concerned specialist obviously an ophthalmologist would do an indirect ophthalmoscopy under anesthesia to find out if there are any retinal hemorrhages or not so this is how the non-accidental injuries might be suspected and what would be uh, your uh, uh, plan for these types of uh, neonates or babies who would present with the uh, suspicion of NAI Then we have got the metabolic uh, group metabolic group is one of the most difficult to pick up Obviously these kids all of a sudden usually by day two or day three they start vomiting They might present with the encephalopathy picture where they are not eating or not feeding well 
they are less active, they are floppy, hypotonic. So very non-specific presentation, very non-specific. Or you might find even orchomegaly or you see that the face doesn't look normal. We call it dysmorphism. So usually for that blood gas, I mean, which we normally do when we are cannulating, maybe that is a very good initial test. So it's even if an exam, somebody asks you what is the best initial test of blood gas because blood gas is going to tell you so many things. It's going to give you the blood sugar levels. It's going to give you the acid base status. So most of uh, these conditions, they are usually they usually present with acidosis, but sometimes they can present the alkalosis as well. Especially urea cycle defects can present with alkalosis. So you look at the lactic acid, you look at the um, uh, blood glucose levels, and you look at the pH, and then accordingly you can think of and ketone levels as well. And if you are you know if you are uh, suspecting metabolic causes, then it's important to uh, to uh, to uh, collect some blood for ammonia levels as so the ammonia uh, is collected in green bottles uh, which we use in the ED and then it has to be transferred on ice to the lab and um, obviously there are certain other types of st uh, tests which are done but usually these are not specific to ED and uh, the only thing is if you pick it up that it's uh, probably a metabolic uh, reason that is more than enough in ED after that it has to be dealt with the metabolic teams which would do a battery of different tests or expensive tests enzyme tests and other things which would finally lead to the uh, diagnosis which specific metabolic disease is causing that some of the metabolic disease are easy to pick, uh, pick up like galactosemia which have got like other uh, pathognomonic signs as well but most of the times like they are quite subtle and it's not easy to pick uh, them up like on 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 a final diagnosis level but you can at least pick it up that it's most probably uh, a metabolic problem and as i said if somebody a child who is even feeding well and feeding well in the sense mean i mean he's not uh, starving and still the blood glucose levels are low then you should be thinking of metabolic reasons how do we treat them initial treatment consists of stopping all feeds all oral feeds have to be stopped because the protein levels in the milk might make the condition worse you have to start them on a 10 percent dextrose infusion so tax if they are hypoglycemic frank hypoglycemia you can give them two mils per kg of 10 percent dextrose uh, other than that once you have given them then they have to be started on dextrose infusion 10 percent dextrose infusion and then obviously uh, they have to be discussed with the metabolic team a quick guide to manage now just like to consolidate all this knowledge let's say a neonate comes to the ED at this point in time you don't know he's got non-specific symptoms which could be anything okay so how do you you know take this child from this point onward so remember this triangle is very important so this triangle actually is where you have to look quickly i mean having a look at the baby give you a lot of information so what you look at when you are looking at the baby from the end of the bed you're looking at his appearance you're looking at his work of breathing and you're looking at the circulation to the skin so appearance how does the baby look i mean if the baby looks subdued he's not active his posture is not uh, I mean if he's if he's awake his posture is like frog like posture he's not actively moving his limbs he uh, uh, seems very much limp so that comes within the domain of appearance at the same time you look at the work of breathing so work of breathing means whether the child is uh, working hard or not is the chest moving very fast or their subcostal recession is there any tracheal tuck and at the same time you look at the circulation to the skin so you'll be looking whether the skin is pale whether what is the capillary uh, time and sometimes plus minus uh, if you can do a blood pressure later on but just by looking at that i mean just doing a cap refill time and looking at the whether it's mottled pale and uh, low cap refill time it simply means that circulation to skin is compromised so a child who hasn't got any increased work of breathing who is alert who is looking eyes are open he's moving his uh, forelimbs equally and his skin is pink it's not mortal the capillary time is uh, is is normal less than two seconds that is a stable child so he comes in this category because the three arms of this triangle are not showing any problem that is a stable child it does not mean that he hasn't got any problem he might be having any of those problems you know within those five groups but at this point in time he's stable stable means that he does not require any 
emergency maneuver at this point in time you need to do a bit more you have to dig a bit more to see what what's going on if a child has got penis seems fine i mean he's alert he's moving his hands and uh, he's like your eyes are open and uh, his circulation to skin is also normal cap refill time is fine he's not gray he's not sinus not mortal but he's working hard so he's got recessions and chest is moving forward now that has got problem with the respiratory work of breathing arm so if there is problem with that we will call it respiratory distress so this neonate has got respiratory distress or so when there's respiratory distress obviously we'll start with oxygen and putting him in on a monitor if with respiratory distress his appearance is not well i mean he looks subdued he looks less active he's limp then it means he's in respiratory failure though so the skin and color and the scap refill time is fine but his appearance and his work of breathing if they are both like abnormal then simply means he's in respiratory failure if the circulation to the skin is compass so obviously he's, he's pale or he's mortal or his cap refill time is less than, is, is greater than two seconds and his appearance is not well so these two or one of that that simply means shock so it could be if simply he has got less circulation to the skin but his work of breathing is fine his appearance fine it might be the early stage of shock if it progresses it would involve his appearance as well and that means that his shock is progressing so these two should be taken as the features of shock if only the appearance is not not fine you feel like he doesn't look well i mean just by his posture or looking at the his, his face but there is no increase in work of breathing there is nothing wrong with his uh, circulation to the skin then probably you are looking at a metabolic or a cns problem and if all are the arms of this triangle and wall he simply means he is in cardiopulmonary failure this is a peri arrest condition he's in serious condition that needs something needs to be done at this point in time so this is a real emergency so this uh, triangle is very important just by looking you are not doing anything you are just looking at the child and by that you can fix him in one of these groups so either you say he's stable whatever the reason is he's in respiratory distress in respiratory failure he's in shock he's in cardiopulmonary failure or perius condition or he has got some metabolic or cns and obviously after that you can do uh, rest of your things so how would you proceed from this point onward like if you look if there is work of breathing is is is, is hard his sets are low you have already attached at this point in time to the monitor if needed you will give him 100 percent oxygen as a respiratory support next step would be to gain an iv access just one or two attempts at iv if it fails just go for iv access you can do the iv later on when you do the uh, iv then you preferably take a cap gas to be given and you start your assessment so by the time you are taking rest of the blood you just take a capillary tube you take some bloods in that you give it to the nurse so she runs it on a blood gas machine to give you the initial values of the blood gas that can give you a lot of valuable information it can give you about the ph status it can give you information about lactate about glucose about calcium and later on you can uh, then collect uh, bloods according to uh, what you are suspecting so if you think there is a sepsis going on you will do the sepsis screen you will take blood for full blood count crp lfts unes and blood culture or you can take blood for metabolic screen if you think that the blood glucose is low and the child is alcoholic or acidotic um, and there is there are other clues like consanguinity or history of uh, sibling deaths things like that then you read the blood gas and determine if iv push is needed or not so if the lactate is you will give them an iv push if you are considering sepsis then you can start iv antibiotic broad spectrum antibiotics again that depends on the from trust to trust if you, again you are thinking of shock you can give iv fluid bolus 10 to 20 mils per kg 0.9 percent saline if you are suspecting cardiac causes like congenital heart disease as i told you earlier you start with prostaglandin e1 infusion at the rate of 0.05 to 0.1 microgram uh, per kg per minute till an echocardiogram is done and either your uh, you know if you are suspecting whether it is confirmed or refuted if the heart rate is greater than 220 you consider svt uh, do an ecg and give adenosine if you find that it is svt 
and uh, the important thing here is to make sure that there are no delta waves like it's not a wolf parkinson white syndrome because in that case adenosine is contraindicated it might make the condition worse if there's hypoglycemia you get two mils per kg of 10 percent dextrose and if you suspect metabolic you will then after that you will also give them 10 percent dextrose infusion and if the child is in cardio pulmonary failure he goes into arrest then obviously you have to start the neonatal bls in that particular case and neonatal bls is different from child bls because you have to give three and one so it's just like um, three chest compressions and then one uh, uh, ventilation breath so this way uh, you would do till yeah, the child uh, you get your um, uh, return of circulation back and uh, you can take it on from that point in time so to sum it up, uh, sick neonate, remember you take history, you look at uh, the child, so look at from that triangle perspective, so look at the work of breathing, look at the appearance, look at the circulation to the skin, make a decision whether the child has got a respiratory distress or respiratory failure or uh, has got CNS or metabolic ozone and shock or is in cardiopulmonary and then after that depending on the other points in history depending on the other uh, findings on your examination uh, you can suspect either something related to sepsis something related to congenital heart problem uh, something related to surgical reasons or NAI and metabolic and as I told you then you go in a systematic way and you stabilize the child and refer them to uh, the concerned specialty which would take take over and do the rest of the definitive treatment uh, to cure the underlying condition so I hope you have understood uh, how to deal with a sick neonate especially if you see them in emergency department so there's nothing to be worried about I know they are small but it's easy to deal with them there will be no wrestling if you try to cannulate them <laughs> it's easy rather than so many people like freak out when they think of this but it's 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 it's, it's relatively easy and as i told you because the differentials are quite limited they can be easily grouped together so if you remember this algorithm it's very easy and it's just a matter of time the more you practice it uh, you can easily master these things and uh, then it becomes breeze for you whenever you deal with a sick unit so there's nothing to be worried about just follow these uh, this algorithmic pattern and uh, if you practice this repeatedly within a short period of time you will be very much confident with dealing with these sick kids so i hope you have liked my video uh, if you liked it uh, press the like button share it with your friends uh, if you haven't subscribed subscribe what are you waiting for and uh, if you want any question uh, do put it down in the comment section below uh, i will answer it and uh, last but not least have a good day bye bye